Good evening. Exciting things are happening in space. For example, we have a new mission near the Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous on its way to the little minor planet Eros. And it's just sent back pictures of a most extraordinary asteroid, Matilda. Look at this. It's a weird shape. It's practically black. And there's one huge crater on it. Somebody once said that Matilda is more crater than asteroid, certainly unlike any of the asteroids we've so far imaged. But of course, at the moment, the main emphasis is all upon Mars. And on Independence Day in America, July the 4th, the Pathfinder mission touched down upon the red planet. It didn't come down gently with rocket braking, as the Vikings did in the 1970s. It was surrounded by airbags, and it bounced. Hit the surface, bounced several times, bounded higher than a 10-story building, and finally came to rest. And already, there were interesting bits of information. For example, compare the atmosphere of Mars now over the atmosphere as it was in Viking times in the 1970s. It's colder uh, and it's clearer. And at a height of 50 miles, the temperature was minus 275 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very chilly. And on the Martian surface at midday, where Pathfinder is, the temperature is round about freezing point, which isn't bad at all. But of course, it gets very, very cold at night, and the temperature plummets down to more than 100 degrees below zero. So Mars does have a, a very forbidding climate. Don't forget, it's 50 million miles further away from the sun than we are. But Pathfinder landed successfully. It bounced. It came to a, it came, righted itself. And then out came the little Sojourner rover and started sending back information about the Martian rocks. At this stage, I'm delighted to welcome back our Mars expert, Dr. Peter Catamell. Welcome back, Peter. Thanks, well, what do you think about Pathfinder? Oh, absolutely amazing. It uh, exceeded most people's wild expectations. It's extremely exciting. Of course, there were one or two initial problems. Well, yes. I mean, the, the thing that saved the spacecraft crashing were these airbags. Um, but unfortunately, one of the things they should have done when the craft came to rest was deflate allowing the capsule to open out like a petal and the craft to roll on the surface. But the bags got in the way of this <laughs> and the, um, the, the engineers had to jiggle the little ramp around and move the bags out of the way, but it, it worked in the end. Of course, remember, Sojourner is pretty small. It's only about the size of a large television set. And then it crawled down the ramp and began sending back details on the Martian rocks. Oh, yes. Well, we, of course, there are, there are two parts of these missions. We mustn't forget the other part. The Sojourner is perhaps to many people the most yes. exciting part, but of course there is the probe itself which has the panoramic camera, which is a multi-spectral camera which allows us for the first time to see the Martian surface in a variety of wavelengths. That's very helpful to geologists. And as you can see in this picture, you can see the horizon, the slightly reddish sky, and a whole variety of rocks, of slightly different colours and shapes, patches of yellowish dust, uh, and darker fragments and this was a, a new, a much um, more highly refined way of looking at the Martian surface. You can see a, quite a large hill in the background there and of course this, this place was where Sojourner was going to move around and start analysing the rocks in, in detail for the very first time. Under a pink sky and of course Sojourner can be guided from Earth. Well, yes, of course, everything is controlled by computer from the USA, which means if something goes wrong or if they see a, a rock they particularly want to get to, they can simply send the command, and with a little time lapse, they can, they can get there and do what they want. What has Sojourner told us about the Martian rocks? Well, it's shown us, first of all, that there are different shapes and colours. For instance, in this uh, picture you see here, on the bottom left, you see the rock Barnacle Bill, yes. pointed out in blue, is a dark, sort of basaltic, but rock with holes in, probably gas bubbles. Whereas in the distance, Yogi, shown with the red arrow, has got a sort of yellowish green top and a dark underneath. So we've, for the first time, uh, seen rocks of quite different composition. <laughs> Lovely nicknames. Yes, well, they do give them some rather strange names. It's quite difficult. It's a new geography, and we have to remember it as it comes in. What about the actual soil? Well, the soil is interesting, as you go back to the same picture. The, the soil is, a, is very, very fine-grained, and one of the things they did particularly was make the little vehicle wiggle its wheels around and scratch the soil up so that we could see how fine it was and how deep it is. And the first thing we found is it's finer than talcum powder. It really is very fine dust. It's not a sandy desert, it's a dust desert, which is, of course, why the Martian winds are able to raise this stuff up high into the air in global dust storms. But the soil itself, it's red, uh, and it's made of particles of minerals probably coming out of mainly basaltic rocks. And that's why the, the stuff is red. It's, it's rusted. The mineral particles that come out of the basaltic rocks are changed to rust. Uh, minerals like peroxine and olivine common in terrestrial rocks, but Mars is a much more 
oxygenated world than the Earth, so there's lots of rusty dust everywhere. Well, of course, the site chosen was the area of Ares Vallis, and Ares Vallis, uh, in the days when Mars had running water, must have been a raging torrent, bringing all kinds of rocks down, and it really come down now in an old floodplain, doesn't it? Yes, well, that's why it was chosen. It's an enormous flood system, uh, bringing debris around, down from the Martian highlands to the south, the distance is over a thousand kilometers, and spreading it out on the floor of the Chrysi Basin which of course is where the, um, the Viking probe landed too, Viking 1. And this is why the site was selected. And this is a panorama across that uh, huge floodplain, and you see a variety of rocks, some rounded, some dark, some more angular. And you can see towards the horizon, you can even make up sort of stratified rocks, suggesting that the flood came down in, at different stages, depositing layers of sedimentary rocks. And we have analysed the rocks. The rocks you see in the foreground have now been analysed. Some of them are basalt, which was what we expected, but surprisingly, some of them are more akin to a rock we know as andesite. And andesite we do find on the Earth, but around the Pacific margins, where Earth's plates are colliding. Now, we don't believe Mars has plates, uh, and therefore we have immediately a problem. We have to explain why Mars has andesites. Um, but most of the rocks are basaltic, and here you see one of the biggest, this two-tone rock. We see both Yogi and uh, Barnacle Bill there. These are names that are going to stick with us forever, <laughs> like other so. Martian features. So it's been a very successful mission. Of course, Sojourner is not programmed to look for Martian life, either past or present, and it won't tell you, give us the answer to that question. But of course, the fact that it's come down there successfully and everything's worked so well does pave the way for future probes. Peter, do you think there ever has been life on Mars? I would like to think so. It would be awfully disappointing if there wasn't. Uh, the chances of finding it at this visit, I think, are, are remote. I mean, just imagine landing from some other planet in, in Clapham Common or somewhere <laughs> and expecting to understand the entire geology and life history of the Earth. That would be most unlikely, and the same applies to Mars. I think we probably will find it one day, but it may take us many years to track it down. Well, Pathfinder is still working. Sojourner is still running around. How long will they last before they go out of action? Well, it was only supposed to be a week or so, but I think it's been so successful they get the go-ahead, if the solar panels work, to go on probably for a month or two. Well, of course, later on this year, we're going to have Mars Global Surveyor, which won't land, will go round and round Mars, and that the surface in more detail than ever before. And in around 2005, the real answer is going to come. We may send an unmanned sample and a turn probe there, scoop out Martian material, bring it back to Earth and analyze it. And then, I think for the first time, we'll know whether there ever has been or is now any life at all on Mars. Peter, thank you very much. But although Mars is so fascinating, don't let's forget there are other planets also, and several of these are now visible in the night sky. So I want to have a general look at these, and in particular, tell you what you can see on them with fairly small telescopes. As I think most people know, the solar system is divided firmly into two parts. We begin with four small solid worlds, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. Then we have a wide gap where we have the asteroids, tiny worlds, bits of stuff. And then beyond that, the four giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, and one small world, Pluto, which is smaller than our moon and probably isn't worth regarding as a proper planet at all. So let's go back to the inner ones, Venus, the brightest of all. Not very well seen at the moment. It sets in the west not long after the sun, but you will see it later on this year, looking almost like a small lamp in the western sky after sunset. And here's a picture of it taken from the Palomar Observatory, and it shows half Venus, bearing in mind, of course, that since Venus is closer to the sun than we are, only 67 million miles out, it shows phases like those of the moon. And here's a drawing I made of Venus a little while ago with a modest three-inch refractor. And you can't see much on it. And frankly, that is not my fault. You never can see much on Venus. In size and mass, it's almost a twin of the Earth, but it's a definitely a non-identical twin. Mars has a very thin atmosphere made of a carbon dioxide. Venus has a very dense, cloudy atmosphere, and we can't see through it. And before the space age, we had no idea what Venus was like underneath. Well, now we know. We got pictures back, and the American Magellan probe went round and round Venus, mapping the surface by radar. And from those radar pictures, we can get pictures like this. And there is a Venus volcano, the one we call Gula Mons. And here's an impression by Paul Doherty of what you might see if you could go to Venus. But I don't think anyone's going to, bearing in mind that the atmosphere is dense carbon dioxide, the atmospheric pressure is 90 times the pressure of our own air at sea level, uh, and those lovely looking clouds are made up chiefly of sulfuric acid, and the temperature is nearly 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So, frankly, Venus is not the world to visit. 
I remember giving a lecture in London years and years ago, and I said then that I thought Venus as a potential colony might be more promising than Mars. How wrong I was. Now then, way out beyond the inner planets, we come to the giants, and the daddy of them all is giant planet Jupiter. Now rises in the late evening, and you can't mistake it, shining down from among the stars in Capricorn as the sea goat, and is far brighter than any other star or planet with the exception of Venus. It's a long way away, nearly 500 million miles from the sun, but it's also very large, much bigger than the Earth. And in fact, you could throw a thousand Earths inside Jupiter and still leave room to spare. But Jupiter is not the same kind of world as the Earth. It's not solid and rocky. There almost certainly is a hot silicate core, surrounded by layers of liquid hydrogen, and above that, the deep, cloudy atmosphere we can actually see. And when you look at Jupiter, all you're seeing is the top part of a layer of gas. And that picture, taken from Palomar Observatory, shows the cloud belts, and there to the left, that strange thing called the Great Red Spot, which is a whirling storm, a phenomenon of Jovian weather. Well, that picture was taken with a big telescope, but even with our three-inch telescope, you can see quite a, quite a lot. And there's a drawing I made a little while ago. Again, you see the cloud belts, and that black spot you can see near the top, that is the shadow of one of Jupiter's satellites. It actually happens to be Ganymede. Various probes have been past Jupiter, and the latest one was named in honor of Galileo. And that went to Jupiter and was divided in two parts. One part actually plunged inside Jupiter and sent back details about what the clouds are like. The other part is orbiting Jupiter now and sending back pictures not only of the planet itself but also of its satellites. And Jupiter has a whole family of moons. That picture taken by Commander Hatfield shows an overexposed Jupiter, deliberately so, and the four Galilean satellites, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. And that's how you're going to see them in a small telescope. But they have, of course, been imaged and Galileo probe has sent back pictures of them all. And they're very different worlds. There is the innermost one, Io, a volcanic world, south of volcanoes, in constant activity, and the most unfriendly place as it moves right in the middle of dangerous radiation zones going around Jupiter. Here is Ganymede, the largest satellite, actually a bit larger than Mercury. And that's an icy, cratered world with a very thin atmosphere and, surprisingly, a, um, a very sm a small magnetic field. Here is Callisto, again, icy and cratered, kind of dead, a kind of cosmic fossil. And of particular interest, I think, Europa. And there are two pictures of Europa, which is just a bit smaller than our moon, sent back by Galileo. It's a fairly smooth, icy surface with strange cracks in it. And there have been suggestions that below those cracks in Europa, there might be an ocean of liquid water in which there might even be primitive life. I may say, I'm extremely skeptical about that. We've just got to wait and see. Anyway, Europa is there, and it's fascinating. Well, beyond Jupiter, we come to the other giant planet, Saturn. Also visible now in the early hours of the morning in the constellation of Pisces, the fishes, shining as a fairly bright, rather yellowish star. Uh, rather smaller than Jupiter, but essentially the same kind of world. And of course, Saturn has this lovely system of rings. That photograph, taken at Lowell Observatory, shows the planet and its rings very well. And various probes have been past Saturn. Here is one by the Voyager probe, and that shows the rings excellently, and that gap in them, known as the Cassini division. Now, those rings may look solid, they're not, they are made up of millions upon millions upon tiny bits of ice, all spinning around Saturn in the manner of tiny moons. And they're very extensive. They extend for 170,000 miles from one end to the other. But they are also very thin, less than a mile thick. And so when they're turned edgewise onto us, as they were in 1995, they practically vanish. And that's the drawing that I made then. Well, this year, they're rather better displayed. You can see the Cassini division again. And next year, they'll be better still. And for the rest of the century, those rings will get wider and wider, as seen from Earth, and we have lovely views of them. And you might like to see this picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, which shows Saturn beautifully, and that white patch in the middle, that is a whirling storm. Saturn is not so active as Jupiter, but it's still pretty active, and there are violent storms there. Now, like Jupiter, Saturn has a whole family of moons or satellites, and the most interesting is undoubtedly Titan. Now, there's a picture of Titan sent back by Voyager 1 in 1980 from close range, and it doesn't show much. All you can see is the top part of a layer of orange smog, because Titan has a dense atmosphere made up chiefly of nitrogen, I may say. And if we could go around Saturn and look at Titan from close range, that might be the kind of view we'd have. And if we could land upon Titan, well, this could be the view. But we don't really know. 
Triton's atmosphere is very large and made up of nitrogen, with a good deal of methane too, and we don't know whether the surface is solid or whether there are me methane oceans there, or even ethane oceans, we're not sure. But certainly, I think the chances of life there are very slight indeed, because Titan is so cold. Temperature more than up minus 270 centigrade, and I think that's too low for any form of life. But we should know, I think, more in the year 2004, when the Huygens probe, carried there by another vehicle, the Cassini, could come down through Titan's clouds and land on the surface. Whether it'll come down on solid land or splash down in a chemical ocean is something we don't know. But Titan, I think, does hold many mysteries for us. So have a look at Saturn if you can. At the present moment, even a modest telescope will show those rings and you'll see Titan as a star-like object. Well, beyond Saturn, the next planet is Uranus, discovered by William Herschel in 1781, also in Capricornus. You can just about see it with naked eye, but no telescope shows very much on it. There's a sketch made by my own 15-inch reflector, doesn't show very much, and even when Voyager 2 went past it in 1986, it still sent back pictures of only a rather bland kind of disk. It's about half the size of Saturn, and again, is a gas giant, although it contains more ice and more water than Jupiter and Saturn do. And beyond Uranus, the outermost giant, Neptune, in Sagittarius the Archer, too faint to be seen with the naked eye. Binoculars show it as a dot. My 15-inch telescope shows it like that. And when the Voyager 2 went past it in 1986, it sent back superb pictures of that lovely blue planet with so-called what's called there the Great Dark Spot. And I must say, the great dark spot was um, a huge storm upon Neptune. It doesn't seem to be there now, because we have imaged Neptune with the Hubble Space Telescope, and the great dark spot appeared to have vanished, but we're not quite sure why. And I'm afraid we won't do a lot, and know a lot more until the new probe gets there. But Neptune does have a family of satellites, and one of these is Triton. And there's a picture of Triton sent back from Voyager, Voyager 2 in 1986. And you can see there pink snow covering the pole. And that is fascinating. It's not ordinary snow, that is nitrogen snow. Triton is so cold that nitrogen condenses out. You can see there also black streaks. Apparently, below that layer of nitrogen ice, there is liquid nitrogen. And if that percolates through to the surface for any reason, the pressure's relaxed, and it explodes in a shower of nitrogen, ice, and gas. And that might be the kind of view you'd get if you were there, because these geysers come up from below the crust, and the resulting debris is blown downwind in the excessively thin Tritonian atmosphere. But whether anyone's ever going to see that? Well, certainly not in our time. Bear in mind, Neptune is more than 2,700 million miles away from the sun, so even a rocket takes a long time to get there. Voyager 2, launched in 1977, didn't pass Neptune until 1989, and is now on its way out of the solar system altogether. So, I think we'd agree, the solar system is a fascinating place. There may be another planet out there, beyond Neptune, beyond Pluto, we're not sure, but if so, it's going to be a long way away and very difficult to locate. But the planets, as we know them, are a very mixed bag, and each one has its own points of interest. Don't forget, if you want the latest information, dial up our Sky at Night information line, 0891-80330, or you can dial up CFAX, page 620. And when I come back next month, we're going to leave the solar system and turn to something quite different. A few years ago, the Hipparchos Astrometric Satellite was launched with the aim of cataloguing the stars more accurately than had ever been done before. It's worked beautifully, and in our next program, we're going to tell you about Hipparchos. But of course, meanwhile, the emphasis is still on Mars. The Sojourner is still crawling around the red planet, sending back these magnificent pictures. And so let's end by having one more look at the surface of Mars, as we're seeing it now, uh, more than 120 million miles away. So for now, good night.